Um, so I need to introduce you to our keynote, our first keynote speaker. He's been hugely supportive of the conference. So William Castell, the chair of the Wellcome Trust, I'm sure all of you will have uh, either met, or known, or certainly seen and heard about. Uh, prior to um, prior to being the uh, the chairman of the Wellcome, he was president and CEO of GE, and then obviously prior to that uh, with Amersham as the CEO. And he's going to be talking to us today with some thoughts and insights into uh, the UK and its game-changing technologies. So please do give a big round of applause to Sir William Castell. Uh, well, good morning. Um, I received this uh, difficult title, The Impact of Science and Translational Research on the UK Economy, and said... Um, it's a very vast field. How do I, for 30 minutes, some way make it engaging for you? Um, I, uh, over a lengthy career in healthcare, have worked in most of the geographies uh, where uh, science clusters are so far identified. And so I think it's interesting to reflect on what we think is special, what I think about is special about the United Kingdom, where at the end of the day, um, not that the Wellcome Trust is required to do it, but where most of the bets of the Wellcome Trust are currently placed. So of the 700 million we're granting a year at the moment, about 80% of that money flows into UK research and translation. So what's special about the UK? Uh, when I grew up, the UK was 4% of the global market. When you look at the products that you're bringing through today, we have about 1% of the population and we will be about 1% of the global healthcare market. Uh, we have, uh, not surprisingly, being part of the Western world, 3% uh, of global research funding in the country. Uh, where the figures get slightly more exciting in terms of uh, academic impact, in terms of the papers we create, 7.9% of papers, and in terms of citations for important papers, 11.8%. So, you know, I, I, I meet a lot of people around the world who say, oh, well, we've seen the decline of, of UK uh, pharma. The, a number of companies manufacturing and researching in the UK have certainly declined. Uh, so things aren't looking so good for the UK. Uh, I look at it the other way. I know I'm always an optimist, but I believe that we are continuing to uh, uh, cut above the investment that's being made in the United Kingdom, we have great opportunity. Uh, the real issue for us in the UK is to have the confidence, the leadership, and uh, a culture that embraces uh, uh, partnerships across the public and private sector. And I think it's that culture, when you go to San Diego or Research Triangle Park or uh, to Boston, then this academic industrial interface is a given. The UK has changed. Uh, I remember uh, forming joint ventures in Harvard in the 70s and coming back to an Oxford college who said, please come and see us. I had a high table with them. I was then uh, running a division of Welcome, and the high table luncheon said, well, I said, why am I here? They said, well, we want you to invest in diabetes. I said, well, I'm very interested in diabetes. We'd like a partnership. No, said the academics, we want your money, not your partnership. Well, that has changed enormously, but we still have, I think, a considerable way to go to maximise the advantages we have in the United Kingdom. And when you look at the preeminence of uh, our UK health spend through the Department of Health, when you look at the MRC, the funding charities, and you see the block of pharmaceutical research, our spend, which is approximately 25 billion within the UK, is a, an extraordinary spend. My hypothesis is we can get at least twofold the return out of that if we learn to partner better. If you look at the challenges we face, uh, when I was a kid, my actuary said, well, you're going to die at 67, and so my pension is phenomenally wrong because at the moment they say I'm dying at 87, <laughs> at least on the average tables. But, you know, the, the world of, uh, of medicine has uh, unquestionably assisted in creating one of the biggest challenges that our society faces today, which is longevity. Longevity brings with it neurological disease, it brings uh, cultural change has brought obesity, but truly shocking for me, because as a kid I thought with cyclosporins we'd really beaten the world of uh, infection. So to see 
I had three friends in the last month who've died from hospital acquired infection. Uh, broken hips into hospital, the hips were rejoined, but they di died of hospital acquired infection. It's quite extraordinary. So the challenges we face are, uh, are extraordinary. We have, no, we have a real respons responsibility within the healthcare community to answer some of these enormous challenges that society faces. Um, but beyond that, it's critically important that we don't only have the research solution, but we have the economic solution. Um, and so I say to my colleagues, you know, 200 years ago, it was quite clear what the position was of the United Kingdom and the world. We were the workshop of the world. In the last century, we haven't been sure about our identity as we declined as a, ge a geographical power, as we saw our workshop diminish especially because of global trade. We're an intelligent nation. We have to do one thing. We have to be a knowledge shop of the world. And my challenge to my colleagues and to all of you is that we need to be the favored knowledge shop of the Western world. It's very difficult to predict what's going to happen to Shanghai and Beijing and Singapore. But if you look across to North America and if you look at continental Europe, I believe we have all of the capabilities and facilities providing we get our leadership and our culture of partnership right and our timing right to be, in 30 years, the chosen knowledge shop of the Western world. And the economic capability that that will bring to this rather small island with 1% of the world's population uh, really is uh, uh, the best bet for our destiny, for our future. Uh, and so when everyone has the chance, one keeps impressing the politicians with that argument and we all collect, share collectively the responsibility to demonstrate not only the research citations and the Nobel Prizes, but equally importantly, the economic impact. Just like to do a brief sample in the room, um, I'm going to ask you to put your hands up if you feel you're a scientist, if you feel you're an entrepreneur, if you are an investor, or if you're a regulator. So I just want to get a feel for the audience. So, for those of you who feel they're scientists, I'm not being derogatory about it, I should put it more positively. Scientists, hands in the air, please. Uh, that's a pretty good majority of the room. Uh, now, who feels that they're an entrepreneur? They can come at it both ways. Very good, congratulations. Thank you for embracing that challenge. Do we have any investors in the room? I can see too few hands. I'm going to put my hand up, I'm an investor. So that's two or three of us. What about regulators and uh, people who are coming at it from a different persuasion? Have we encouraged the regulators here today? So part of our challenge for next year is to bring in the regulators because they are a key part of the partnership, and I'll come to that. Um, I, uh, I spent the whole of my career in the healthcare industry. I had uh, 20 years at the Wellcome Foundation, uh, I started in marketing, moved to finance, moved to R&D, and finished up as commercial director. Uh, I then moved to uh, Amersham. So within the pharmaceutical sector, I did first vaccination, then therapeutics. And amongst other things, launched AZT, which was the first antiretroviral drug for AIDS. At Amersham, um, I uh, um, had the joy of working with the great minds there for 14 years. Amersham was bought by General Electric. Uh, it was a move that allowed us to put alongside biology, engineering, and IT. And uh, I hoped that, that would allow us to integrate uh, these three disciplines uh, because the convergence of these technologies for innovation in this century is going to be, in my opinion, of vital importance. Uh, and then uh, I returned from uh, General Electric to chair the Wellcome Trust, where I've been chairing for seven years. Um, so that's the background, but I'm going to take you on a, a little journey um, because I think my life really started in the area of therapeutic proteins. And in 1978, I was uh, a co-shareholder of a bankrupt company 100 miles south of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. And we were making anthelmintics, foot and mouth disease vaccine, uh, and uh, pifpath, which was extract of pyrethrum to knock out the flies. Uh, I was running, well, at that stage, I was an accountant. And uh, John Bain, the research director of 
the Wellcome Foundation said to me, can you manufacture interferon? Uh, so I plunged into science for the first time, and we had to scale up from 10 litres of human cells to 8,000 litre vatches if we were going to be successful. Um, and uh, uh, then I asked the question, why? And the question why was only answered because on a hot summer's evening in June 78, I got home early to see the children. I usually don't get home until 10 or 11. I poured a gin and tonic and I was watching and I remember distinctly a spaghetti cowboy with Clint Eastwood. And so the subconscious got to work and I thought I'd better phone America. So I phoned a director inquiries and I said I want the phone number of, the high of our ambassadorial uh, uh, am embassy in Washington. I got through and I asked for the first commercial attaché. And I said to the first commercial attaché, um, I know how to manufacture interferon, but I don't know where the market opportunity is. I think Congress is discussing it. He said, I'll come back to you. And two hours later, the man I'd never met before from Washington phoned me at home. Spaghetti Cowboy was just coming to the end with that magical music that you can whistle, but I won't do that for you now. And uh, he said, the Congress has the equivalent of Hansard. I'm putting it in the diplomatic bag. You'll have it the day after tomorrow. So I went on to the Wellcome Foundation board and said, the National Cancer Institute has got a grant from Congress to invest in interferon as a biological response modifier. And uh, we have the opportunity of bidding for it. Uh, fortunately for me, the board accepted the challenge. And uh, we bid for it, and we got the first NCI contract for a therapeutic protein that had been fermented. And uh, we started to supply uh, interferon to the USA. In 1980, uh, I wrote a paper saying we should move our steam and dream virology and bacteriology into protein science and molecular biology. And what we need to do is to target being not only the leader in immunoprophylaxis, but in therapeutic proteins. And if I look at the story of interferon, there are lessons, I think, because I had no money. The, the Wellcome Foundation said, you have to make it pay. So we hedged bets, and we did a technology transfer to Japan. Uh, we did a joint venture in, in Harvard with Genetics Institute, built a manufacturing plant in Rhode Island. Uh, we pursued alpha interferon and uh, TPA. I worked with Jim Watson at Cold Spring Harbor. It was his TPA. The issue then, and I'll come back to it, was is it glycosylated? And if so, how does the protein fold? And do we express in a, uh, in a uh, chow cell or can we use bacteria because the chow will, will glycosylate and the bacteria won't? So we got interferon to the market. Uh, we were terribly short of understanding what the hell it would do. We tried about every cancer. In the end, it turned out to be a better product for treating virus disease, and it looked initially like it was right in hepatitis B. We didn't do the product development. We didn't get pegylated interferon. We didn't take it into the hepatitis C market. So we hedged our bets. We were too early with our timing to really make this a, a, a target which you could successfully develop within a reasonable time scale and within a reasonable cost. What we went wrong was uh, not doing the product development. Uh, in making alpha, alpha interferon, we used to spin off gallons of beta interferon every day, never investigated it, and that later turned out to be good in multiple sclerosis. Uh, on the way, Genentech came and said, we'd like you to have EPO. No, it was not Genentech, it was Amgen. Amgen said, we'd like you to have e EPO. We want your fermentation capability. Didn't take that opportunity. And there was something called TNF, which was on the shelf, but we didn't know what it did. And so, you know, and it, this, so the importance here is that at least we recognized that it wasn't interferon, it was therapeutic proteins. And we're going to come back later on today to discuss platforms. And we've got wonderful platforms to go through with you. But critical is to understand how you do the platforms and what they may spin off. What I can say to you today, that little uh, bankrupt plant in Spain is still a Genentech major manufacturing unit. The uh, plant they built in the States is Amgen's. Uh, Bob Bradway popped in the other day to tell me that it was still going well. And they put $3 billion into it. So that's Newport, Rhode Island. 
And uh, the plant uh, Perbright, which I'm going to come back to, which was a foot and mouth disease plant we ran, is now owned by Intervet, which is owned by Merck. And uh, in the last two days, several people have told me they're investing in a joint venture with Merck to look at capsids. And I'm going to come back to capsids at a great platform. So with hindsight, uh, we're going to hear about structural biology today. I wish I'd had it. Uh, we're going to hear about stem cells. I wish I'd had that because I could have stopped experimenting in humans in the way that we had to to see whether interferon, which always gave you flu-like symptoms, but very rarely gave you that magical cure. And I remember being at once that uh, I used to go out to Nigeria once a month to try and deal with another difficult company. Um, and uh, I, got, I got called at the airport, and it was the Monian, Monsignor of the Pope who'd been shot. Could they have interferon to cure the viral infection that the Pope had? So it was interesting having the rigour of saying, no, this is a closed clinical trial platform. And the, uh, the Soviets came, in, came on, they wanted it. The Pope came on. Interestingly, our royal family never came on. So, uh, but there were pressures which were rigorously fought off. Um, the story has an exciting sequel, and it comes back to platforms uh, and structural biology. And... Uh, you know, uh, they didn't get quite what I needed, but there's the pegylated interferon molecule, and I never had the chance of seeing that. There's a bovine interferon gamma. I spent a lot of time. I had seven manufacturing plants around the world for foot and mouth disease, and seven years of enormous investment in BP1 research, and what was the activity within foot and mouth disease, and could we make it genetically? Uh, this comes... This is the structure of foot and mouth disease. This comes out of the diamond facility. 32 beam channels uh, will be commissioned by the end of next year. I think we have 16 commissioned at the moment. Uh, the biggest uh, investment in physics in the last decade in this country, 483 million pounds, uh, a great accelerator. Uh, fortunately, uh, some of the beam channels have high containment. So the FMD virus was looked at. That picture was created. And then using in silico biology, uh, a capsid was, has been developed. A partnership between Oxford, Reading Universities, Purbright, Harwell, and Intervet. And so we now have something which is quite unthinkable. We have a vaccine that works without a viral component, just the protein shell. It's been in a full animal challenge at Purbright in the great new challenge facilities there and the immunized group with just the capsid, fully protected. Those challenged all developed foot and mouth disease. So we know we have a capsid that's working. Um, we know that we, it's expressed in insect cells. We can make it in a very simple facility. It's cheap and effective, and it looks like it has a longer life. So it means that unlike the last foot and mouth out, disease, out, disease outbreak when we had three and a half million cattle lying on the surface of the UK, we can immunise because we can detect between immunisation and the disease. So we can ring fence or immunise the entire UK cattle. If we can demonstrate that we can deal with the 10 subsets of foot and mouth disease, then we can use this vaccine worldwide. For the developing nations, this is truly an extraordinary benefit because foot and mouth disease is endemic. So the conversion into milk and protein is very low. If we get this through in the next 10 years, this vaccine should be used, it looks like, annually for annual immunisation. At the moment, you have to immunise twice. If you've got to herd up all the cattle in Kenya, that's an expensive task. So I'm very interested in this capsid development. I'm very interested in what it can do in hepatitis, what it can do in polio in terms of, of the resistance we're seeing to polio, and probably, most importantly, moving quickly to flu. Because if we could see any cross-protection in flu, then we could have a little bit more confidence, whether it's avian flu or the Middle Eastern flu that we now have seen coming out of fruit bats in eastern Saudi Arabia. We have the chance of saying zoonotic incidences that can knock our legs out, as Spanish flu did. More people died after the First World War of Spanish flu than died in the war. We need to find an ex a way of combating zoonosis. So this is a great platform. It's a great example of a partnership. I was asked to go to the House of Lords three days ago by Lord Putman. He wanted to introduce me to someone. It was a Mexican tri trained in Harvard who's a venture capitalist 
And in discussion, he said, oh, I've just invested in a company developing capsules for hepatitis. And I thought, move very quickly. I immediately went back to welcome and said, what the hell is our technology patents on this? Because <laughs> it already seems to be out being developed by others in the world. But that was another discussion. I'd like to move on again to partnerships um, and the story of the evolution of technology, because technology always takes longer platforms, in my experience, to get to the market than you would dream of. Uh, in 1996, uh, we became aware in Amersham of the uh, force that you could do in terms of diagnosis of using hyperpolarized helium and xenon. Rare gases, so it wouldn't be a common diagnostic technique, but nevertheless, if you hyperpolarize helium or xenon, you could look at, at metabolism within a single cell within the brain. Such is the imaging capability. So it's an IV injection of something which is hyperpolarized at one Kelvin. Has a half-life of about uh, uh, 40 seconds. So you've got to spin it at one degree Kelvin, get it back up to body temperature, GMP, release it, inject it, and image it. Uh, we thought this on at Amersham, but we weren't a great engineering company. General Electric arrived. They did the engineering. But we're still left with the fact that the gas is uh, inert and rare. And then someone came along with para-hydrogen, York University. And para-hydrogen is ubiquitous. Signal to noise on MRI goes a million to one, up. So here's something which is ubiquitous that can become a regular diagnostic technique but interestingly, that signal to noise going a million to one means that we can probably dramatically reduce the magnetic forces we need for MRI. In an MRI scanner, the cost of the magnet is about one and a half million dollars. A lot of them made in China. So my challenge to the team in York is to say, whilst I'm very interested to get the cell in metabolism in the brain, I'm also keen to use a domestic magnet in MRI so that we can come out with technology that could become ubiquitous. Uh, I worked for a few years with a remarkable man called Omar Ishrak, who developed General Electric's ultrasound uh, ability. And this was fusing technology together from Israel, from Norway, from Germany, from the USA. Uh, this machine uh, was uh, designed in Bangalore, uh, manufactured in China. Uh, I know what the manufacturing costs are. Uh, I'm frustrated it isn't in every university for every medical student because it has all the power of that 80 kilo machine that you saw wheeled around the hospital 10 years ago. And if you're in the bush and you're looking, and, and I, can do, I can do hearts well enough, because it tells you up, down, stop. And if I'm not sure I can read it, I can just push a trigger and it's downloaded to my radiographer who gives me his reading so I can do bush medicine. I'm gonna move on now to what I think is critically important for us, and I, and it was in big pharma for years, and I've been around biology for years, but the integration of uh, uh, engineering uh, into, uh, into uh, science is, I believe, one of the vital uh, opportunities we have in the United Kingdom. So if we talk about medical engineering at, in, initiatives, uh, and let me move briefly on to uh, uh, Wellcome Trust, uh, we started uh, a joint scheme with the EPSRC in 2009, which was a £41 million investment in engineering, where we required those who bid to bring together mass physical science, engineering, and medical research. Delightfully, that uh, initial £41 million has already been followed by another £121 million, and 29 patents have been filed. And we're so delighted with the results that we've put a new scheme together with the PSRC, which will be similar in terms of its uh, focus on medical innovation of a 30, further 30 million pounds. So we, took, we went as a board, uh, the Wellcome Trust to Boston uh, a year and a half ago, and we went to look at the Broad, and then we moved on to the Koch Institute. And the place that knocked our socks off was the Koch Institute. The Koch Institute is a cancer institute where everyone there is required to spend 25% of their time on cancer research. Everyone there is not only uh, biology, but it's every aspect of engineering. And wrapped around the biology are the engineers, and engineers like solutions. 
Um, I, when I used to manage biology, they were, I had steam and dream bacteriologists. Uh, and you'd kick the vessel and you'd get a better output. Uh, that was the level of science. By surrounding the molecular biology with engineering, they're reverse engineering uh, uh, evolution. Why is the Ormer shell so tough? How is it structured? Encrypting gold into bacteriophages for new use in the electronics industry. It's a truly extraordinary innovation. So uh, partnerships are vital. If we stay within our, our silos of structural biology or, or protein sciences or, uh, or labels for uh, uh, PET imaging, we're not going to get all the way there. We need the partnerships to evoke the ideas and increasingly you know, the breadth of ideas you need to bring together uh, research opportunities. It's the universities we have to look to for the knowledge hubs because not even Big Pharma can inform, can have world leadership in algorithms, world leadership in physical sciences, world leadership in biology, and then all the, all the processes behind that. So it's vital that as we move into this century, we understand the university's role, they have the vital aspect which industry just can't afford, which is that breadth of interdisciplinary research that can truly originate new product concepts. Just briefly about funding. Uh, I always find working out funding in the UK pretty difficult. This slide says where it all comes from. This is 2012. Public research institutes, 2.5 billion. Universities, 7.2 billion. Private, business and not-for-profit charities, 16 billion. UK numbers, broadly speaking, a 25 billion spend. So the effectiveness with which we spend that, the money, it'd be nice to have more venture capitalists here and we'll get more next year. Uh, what, uh, but there is quite a lot of funds in the system and what I'm pleased to say is that the level of partnership between academia, the MRC, and the private sector, in my opinion, has never been better. Keep going the wrong way on this. Sorry about this. So uh, a few comments on where Wellcome's been trying to help with uh, the pre-competitive investment. Uh, over the last uh, decade, We've spent just over 400 million in the technology transfer scheme. Uh, that has been followed by 900 million pounds of external investment. And so, you know, it's nice to measure one's output beyond citations and start to see the flows of money. It's even better, as far as I'm concerned, when you can see the CAPSID as a new platform for, for many, uh, many diseases. So, uh, a, uh, 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 a Slide that captures what we've been doing in technology transfer. Brief word about um, partnerships. The biocatalyst at Stevenage is up and running. It's a 35-acre site. The initial investment uh, was 38 million. It's made between government, GSK, and the Wellcome Trust. Uh, it is very much focused on convergent technologies. So we have engineering in there. We have stem cells in there. We have um, mathematics in there. I met with Andrew Whitty last week, said, very pleased with the way it's going, Bill. And, but we need to bring in more of the convergent technologies. And the initial 60,000 square feet can go up to a million square feet, such as the acreage. And what I'm proud about is that we get access there for the scientists who join to the uh, GSK uh, gym, to the GSK canteen, and GSK is fully integrated in the partnership of, uh, of the biocatalyst. And what's more, we have the most stimulating architecture on that site, not quite as monolithic as the Stevenage site. So the buildings are up and running, and the biocatalyst is working. Uh, this is the Francis Crick uh, Lecture Theatre. Uh, this is the Francis Crick Institute. It's a partnership between government, the Medical Research Council, the Wellcome Trust, UCL, Imperial, Kings, uh, and um, left out one, UCL, Kings, Imperial, 
Oh, and Cancer UK, I beg your pardon. So about 700 million pounds of construction, uh, 1,500 scientists in there. Paul Nurse is the director, uh, will be occupied in October of 2015. I was quizzed last night, how is it you can be fully occupied? I said, well, we might be over-occupied. We're merging Cancer UK and Mill Hill as a starter before we wrap around the engineering and the excellence of clinical. The reality is it's going to have excellent science. The perception is it's an iconic statement. And people, the French ambassador came to see me and said, I know what you're doing. This is a difficult trick. You're right by the Eurostar and you're going to take all the best science from Europe up the Eurostar and into the crick. I said, spot on, Ambassador. <laughs> so to have the French mesmerised was a wonderful telling moment. Um, that being said, I think it, you know, we're going to have great basic research wrapped around with schools of engineering and very close to the clinic. And even more importantly, we've got UCL and Imperial and Kings talking as partners. And I was with John Took last week and he said, it's amazing. The strong divisions and competition between us are going and we're now evolving a much wider meritocracy. So it's a big investment. Uh, it's uh, over £700 million to put it up. The running budgets are quite significant, uh, and it will be up and running uh, in uh, a concept that started in uh, 2007, will be commissioned in 2015. So... If you talk about partnerships, we have further to go. We've got GSK on open innovation. We've got adaptive licensing being talked about. We need to get to adaptive licensing, which the US has done. We need to speed that rigorous process of uh, clinical trial approval. And, uh, and the, uh, we need, I think, a much better balance between risk and reward. So as we embrace stem cells and iPS cells, society should be demanding that it isn't uh, no risk and all reward, we have to accept, as we wouldn't get aspirin licensed today, that as we innovate new platforms, we need some risk in the system. Finally, on partnerships, it's absolutely critical that our regulatory processes get proactive. Uh, I put photographs into the cloud last night. I didn't know one could do that. We're putting genetic data into the cloud. We're going to have genetic diagnosis on Facebook. We're going to have people, as they are right today, stem cell uh, therapies being brought broadly touted around the world, and even major governments like the Chinese desperately worried about the overclaiming for stem cell solutions and private medical techniques. So we've got to encourage our regulators to be proactive, not sit there conservatively. They've got to be bold as we embrace the new medicines and go out there and create a regulatory environment so that we don't get with the new medical technologies where we came out with Frankenstein foods on genetic, genetically modified crops. We have to be proactive in our regulation. And I was thrilled to see Sally Davis announce mitochondrial disease, the paper that will go to before government next year. We could be the first nation in the world that will rid mothers of the mitochondrial contamination of their, uh, of, in their uh, ovum. So we're making progress. So finally, in, in uh, conclusion, um, given that I'm an optimist, I'm also a realist, I believe that the UK biomedical community has the opportunity, has the platforms to make an extraordinary contribution, not only to man's needs, but also to the economy of the United Kingdom. We have to be a knowledge cluster and we should target being the knowledge cluster of the Western world. We have the science. If we get our timing right and we keep pushing our partnerships and we get the visionary leadership, then we can do it. Not many people, if you look the other way around, have the opportunities that we have. And you're going to hear later this morning about some great platforms. You're going to hear about genomics and stratified medicine. You're going to hear about structural biology, the synthetic genetic polymers, and human cell therapy. So I put it to you that we've all had an enormously emotionally long journey with Andrew Murray. Now, if he can win Wimbledon, then we can win in the United Kingdom. Thank you very much.